Welcome to another edition of RCE. This is Brock Palin. You can find the entire collection of all of our back episodes on rce-cast.com. There's an RSS link there as well as a link into the iTunes library. I have also, again, Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for taking some time out. Yeah, and I would just like to point out that all of our shows are wardrobe malfunction free and um, uh, misbehaving singer malfunction free as well. Well, it kind of helps that we're audio only and we don't even try to sing. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I think that would be pretty ugly, actually. (laughs) So there's other information off the website. You can find a link to Jeff's blog as well as my new blog um, and our Twitter feeds and all the usual stuff on there. I also throw out some questions and stuff about the podcast. You guys can give us... Uh, any questions you'd like to have included about upcoming stuff, you can follow That's me right. at Brock Palin, all one word. Um, and you can find Jeff off of mine, actually. Yeah, there you go. Good enough. Feedback is always appreciated, and we always take uh, suggestions for new topics for podcasts and things like that. And by the way, Brock, you got to say the name of your blog because it is just kind of funny. Oh, Fast Failure as a Service? Failure as a Service. Yeah, I got, a, I got a hat tip to Matthew Britt, who came up with that one and was nice enough to actually let me use that name. Uh, he's a great guy. I work with here at U of M, and that, that name was just like, wow, c- can I use that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and get on with today. Brock, who do we have today? Uh, who we have today are, um, we have two people. Uh, they're both at Argonne um, at the Mathematics and Computer Science Division. Uh, we have Rob um, Latham and Rajiv Takur um, will give them an opportunity to introduce themselves, but they're here talking about Romeo. So, Rob, why don't you go ahead and give us a little rundown? Hi, I'm, I'm Rob Latham. I've been at Argonne for 10 years. I work on the, the, uh, the Romeo library and some other uh, I.O. libraries and uh, often work with applications to help them use this stuff effectively. I'm Rajiv Takur. I'm a senior computer scientist at Argonne. Uh, I've been here almost 17 years now, and I work on uh, MPI, MPitch, Parallel I.O., and so forth. I was the original author of Romeo, which is what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so this stuff is uh, obviously near and dear to my heart. Uh, I know these guys. Rajiv, I see all the time at the MPI forum meetings, and as of this recording, at least, we'll see each other in about a month at the next forum meeting in Chicago. Yeah, if I could in- interject a little something here, uh, this this topic, uh, MPIIO and Romeo, this is something that a lot of users don't know exists. And if you're a user or you're a writer of MPI applications, this is something to be aware that it is actually possible to, to do parallel I/O, and it can make your life a lot simpler. So actually, let's roll right into this. Um, can one of you give us a rundown of what was the motivation behind MPIIO and what is it? So MPIIO is an interface for parallel file I/O from a parallel program from MPI programs, and the motivation behind it was similar to the motivation behind MPI in the first place. So there was there wasn't before MPIIO there wasn't a, a, a single portable way of doing parallel I/O from from a program, and uh, MPI one had just come has, had just been released, and so it made sense to to think about whether something like that could be done for I.O. And Mark Sneer from IBM Research uh, at that time first came up with this idea, I think, in 94 to explore the use of uh, MPI-like uh, uh, interface for I.O. So I do have to ask, where did the name Romeo come from? Yeah, many people asked me about it. And so it, that came much later because I was implementing MPI I.O. And before I had to release it, it, it needed a name as such. And I couldn't come up with a good name, so you know the MIO came from MPIIO and R potentially from my name, and O was needed to complete a word in some way. So <laughs> it doesn't mean anything, but it has MIO for uh, that that looks like MPIIO. Gotcha. So uh, we kind of avoided the question till now, but what is Romeo? So Romeo is an implementation of the MPIIO interface. Uh, that MPIIO is now uh, an official part of MPI, and now means since '97, so it's a good 15 years. So it's an implementation of that one chapter, and it's a portable implementation. It works on many file systems, and it works with many different MPI implementations. And it's actually included as part of many MPI implementations. So users don't see it separately as such anymore. And because of its uh, liberal licensing and, and popularity, it, it's, it is common to, to use them as 
weak synonyms. MPIO and, and Romeo often get used interchangeably, but it is uh, one is a standard and one is an implementation. So. So before uh, MPIO was defined or Romeo existed, did people even do Parallel-IO? Yes, they, it, it, Parallel-IO was in its early stages in those days, but it, it was used and uh, different. there were a few uh, parallel file systems. There was one from Intel, there was one from IBM, and the IBM Vesta, and they all had their own uh, interfaces. They were POSIX-like interfaces, but they had their own extensions. There were also some higher level libraries like the Passion library that I worked on as a graduate student. So there were different ways of doing I.O. Uh, there was no one standard way of doing it. So actually, before we go too far into this, what what does MPIO give you as a user um, in terms of benefit? It, it gives you a portable interface that is like MPI. So if you're in an MPI program, it's quite natural to use it. And it allows you to express your I.O. in the form of collective operations, uh, in the form of non-contiguous operations expressed using MPI data types and so forth. And it provides well-defined uh, and clean semantics for what it means you know, when multiple processes are writing to the same file. Uh, and, and so forth. So you get you get the semantics, you get the the features that you need for writing, you know, uh, for accessing files in parallel, and potentially you can get the performance from an implementation of MPI. So what is, what is the difference? Why why can't I, as a you know, I'm I'm a sharp application developer guy. I've been doing MPI codes for years. Why can't I roll my own and you know parallel IO? What's what's in it for me to use the one that's built into MPI? So there have been a lot of application people who have, over, especially recently in the last five years, it seems, who have done just that, tried to do, do these optimizations by themselves and, and use uh, their own way of doing parallel I.O. And sometimes it can work well, but often there are certain uh, file system characteristics, let's say, that um, need to be dealt with. And, and one of the benefits of, of Romeo is this file system abstraction layer, and so we can put in an optimization that's specific for GPFS, specific for Panathis, specific for Luster, and those details can be hidden from the application user. And then when the application person does his I.O. on machine A or machine B or machine C, he doesn't have to worry about retargeting and reinventing those optimizations. And some of the optimizations can be hard to implement. So a, a library writer you know, might might want to do it once, but uh, for an application person, it, it's probably a lot of work to, to re redo all of that in this application. Can you give us an example of one of these optimizations? I think the most, uh, the most uh, desired optimization right now is this idea of uh, aggregation. And we have these processes that, that scale to hundreds of thousands of, of MPI processes now, and uh, people find pretty quickly that if you do I.O. from all thousands Hundred thousand processes, you'll uh, you'll swamp the I/O system and, and just get really bad performance. So instead, you pick a subset of these processors and um, and use them to do I/O on behalf of everybody else. It does a couple of it does a couple things for you, but for the sake of uh, um, making a more friendly request workload to the file system, that's really the biggest benefit. Now, you can do this as an application person, but sometimes there are some machine-specific topologies that you can take it even more advantage of. So that's, um, that's something, for example, on BlueGene that's done on behalf of the user. And if you were to implement it yourself, you may uh, end up putting all of your processes on, on one or two network links versus being more evenly distributed across the system. So when I was reading up on this, I ran across something called hints. Is that specific to MPIIO or is that specific to Romeo? That's a, that is a, a tuning feature defined in the MPI standard. Uh, you know, all the, a lot of these interfaces have some way of hinting. Even if you uh, open a file and pause it, you pass in flags saying what you're going to do with it. I'm going to read the file, read, read only or write only or, or read and write. And... Uh, well, these are some. This is something similar where you you can provide some indication of your intention to the MPI I/O library. Uh, hints are uh, very simple to use. They're they're string-based key key value pairs, and uh, they have the other defined uh, benefit that you can do whatever you want as far as setting keys and values, and the implementation can ignore them. 
so for example, you set a bunch of hints that are specific for one file system or one implementation, uh, and implementation B doesn't know what they are, then it doesn't, it's not going to affect your program. It will just be quietly ignored. So an example of a hint would be how many uh, disks you want to stripe your file across, or the size of the striping unit, and, and so forth. So how important is uh, parallel I.O. to any given application? Well, the applications find uh, parallel I.O. pretty important now. It, right? You've got bigger and bigger machines and, and more and more computation, but the storage part is getting uh, a little bit uh, performing a little bit less. It improves performance less rapidly, so you need to get a lot more simultaneous uh, I.O. operations going. So... Uh, the parallel I/O becomes important for analysis to um, you know to study these data sets and make sense of them. And it makes it needs it's important for the uh, initial data sets you, to to feed these simulations, and then of course uh, for defensive I/O, checkpoint I/O, and and periodically outputting uh, a history of what's going on. Um, you know those are all periods that have to happen in order for computation to continue or to not waste computation. So the faster that those pieces can happen. The, uh, the more science that can get done. So there was a number of talks I've been at where they talk about trying to scale, you know, I.O. operations, you know, these 100,000 plus core systems. And there was a lot of talk about kind of moving away from POSIX and other things. Is that something that's more in the file system layer or is that in, or does Romeo have a part in that solution? Well, I think Romeo could be a part of that solution. Of course, in, in computer science, we just put more and more abstraction layers. So, Deep, deep underneath MPIO is a is a parallel file system with POSIX I/O calls. But Rajiv mentioned this uh, file system abstraction layer inside Romeo, and so you could very well put something in there that didn't do POSIX, but instead spoke in terms of objects or scientific databases or whatever else was appropriate. And even though these drivers have since kind of uh, gotten a little bit rusty, uh, we do have drivers in Romeo for things like Grid FTP and uh, some experimental drivers for logistical networks and things that aren't really file systems but have uh, benefited from being part of, being underneath an MPIO interface. So do I have to do anything as an admin to be able to support this or do I just have to provide a file system? Well, the file system does have a bearing on how much parallel I.O. performance can be provided uh, Certainly, uh, being able to to support um, simultaneous connections without data corruption or, or uh, loss of performance would be great. And if the file system has some super crazy optimizations for for non contiguous I/O or or um, concurrent I/O, that would be beneficial too. And and we've done this in Romeo for for different file systems like PVFS or um, some of the more ideal distributions for Lustre. Um, and even found ways to work around NFS's consistency semantics. Um, so for an administrator, uh, you know, uh, the trickiest part is, is making sure that Romeo is built with support for all these different file systems. And sometimes uh, the, the MPI that comes with your distribution or, or vendor may not be, uh, may need a little more tuning, but sometimes that's easy to fix with a little bit of cooperation from whoever provides you the cluster. So here's a weird case. Can you actually use Romeo without a single namespace shared parallel file system? Probably not, because we we expect to be able to directly read or write. But you could write a, a new device underneath, you know, instead sort of one that talks to a file system, one that can deal with such a thing. Um, so you're you're kind of implementing this shared file abstraction one layer below Romeo. All right, so Brock actually threw out a bunch of buzzwords there. Let me try and disentangle one of them. He, he mentioned parallel file systems. Now, it's got the same buzzword parallel that, you know, MPI does. So is, is MPIO a one-to-one -one mapping for parallel file systems, or are they similar and complementary technologies? Or, you know, what, what is their relation to each other? So pa parallel file systems are, provide just the basic read-write of contiguous data but in parallel. So they, they support concurrent reads and writes to a single file, and they try to give high performance for that. They may have a few additional optimizations, but, but Romeo is, is a 
uh, has a lot more functionality than that. So panel file systems don't have the notion of collective I.O. They don't know that it's multiple processes of an MPI program are part of one application, and they might need to access you know, one, one big data set in parallel, maybe different parts of it, but they're actually accessing one three-dimensional array or so forth. So they don't have that level of knowledge, or they're not designed for that. So they can handle, they, they are similar to the POSIX API, maybe slightly more than that. But underneath what they can do is they can stripe the file across multiple servers or I.O. Uh, you know, nodes or disks. And so they can give you good I.O. bandwidth and performance for you know, multiple clients accessing different parts of a file uh, simultaneously. So how important are uh, new hardware technologies, uh, things like solid state drives or you know, caching front ends for file systems and such? So, uh, no, go ahead, Rajiv. So all those are important in that they'll improve performance. And you know, if the, if the file system, uh, so the file system can do something to do a better job of, uh, of managing those devices or, or uh, tuning for those devices. And probably some things can be done at the MPI IO layer also to do better with that. I don't think we're doing anything right now specifically for. No, we don't have anything planned, but um, it kind of hits, suggested that some of these. Uh, features of MPIO that make optimizations like this possible. There's this idea of a consistency semantics, which, which have these rules for when data is visible and, and, and accessible and, and permanent on disk. And these rules actually lend themselves really well to having, say, a, a burst buffer a, or some other uh, solid state device handy uh, holding these intermediate requests before uh, writing out to the, the more permanent storage solution. So these are all details you know, as the hardware gets more sophisticated, the MPIO layer can be improved to uh, hide the details from the application user. But as Rajiv says, we don't do that yet, but it's one of the areas we can look at down the road. Now, are file system vendors like parallel file system vendors and even hardware uh, storage vendors – are they being influenced by the MPI standard? Like, uh, you know, we've seen networks that are created that were, you know, pretty much purpose built for MPI communications. Is the same thing happening on the storage side, or are, is, is HPC mostly the recipient of innovation that happens over in storage? We don't see very much attention from the vendors, except as a secondary concern. When, when, when customers buy machines, they're buying. Uh, CPU cycles and high-performance networking, and the storage is um, sometimes uh, a secondary concern. And, so, and the vendors rightly, you know, prioritize the the the, the those other con the, the vendors. If the customer is giving them money for X and Y, they're going to focus on X and Y. Uh, but we have had some good relationships with with vendors like Cray and and, Blue and IBM to uh, to help get the best performance out of these file systems. It, it is, as you, suggest, as you suggest in the second part of your question, and more of a, um, it makes MPIO and Romeo more reactive to parallel file systems um, than, than driving the development, I think. Yeah. And it could be that in some procurements, there are some applications or benchmarks that are run that internally use MPIO through libraries or whatever, through HDF or NetCDF mm -hmm. or whatever, and then they ultimately hit the file system. And so the vendors have to make sure they meet those, whatever the performance requirements might be. That's a very good point. The, the requirements are often specified in terms of application behavior, not specifically MPIO must do this, but more high-level uh, applications must achieve these science-oriented benchmarks. Yeah. So we talked a lot about abstraction in there and performance, uh, but but then you also mentioned during the hints, we might want to say how many hard drives to stripe over. What are some of the common hints um, and stuff should uh, a user ask their administrator what what our settings should be? You know, for the most for the most part in in, in today's ecosystem, uh, the hints are, are often meant for the library library people or. Or other specialists to um, to use the application person uh, probably doesn't need to worry about hints at first. Um, probably the most important angle of optimization for the applica application person is to just keep on using uh, collective routines to use high, to use um, data types or high-level libraries to describe the I/O workload, 
and in these ways provide enough context for the, uh, the libraries and the MPIO implementations to do the right thing. The hints are really useful for folks like me who come in and, and work with the application people and can help um, make these suggestions based on uh, what's going on. But if the application person has done Collective.io with data types to the library, to the file system today, that's pretty much, um, oh, sorry, or using a high-level I.O. library like HDF5 or Parallel on that CDF, those are really the biggest things an application person can do to get good performance. And there are some hints that can be used to change some parameter settings within Romeo, uh, such as the buffering parameters, maybe uh, you know, the sizes of buffers used for collective I.O. or other optimizations and some other algorithmic parameters. So that's in addition to uh, the I.O. hardware or the, you know, the striping and, and those kinds of things. And uh, these are all advanced, uh, you know, these are for advanced users or library writers or those who want to tune their I.O. performance. Okay, so for something like Luster, where the default setting is, you know, one stripe or whatever the admin sets it to, is Romeo going to kind of use a sane default, or is it just going to use what the file system's default is? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good example of uh, of the, the Luster driver in, in, in Romeo. Uh, for a long time, there, there wasn't much smarts. Luster, there were not many Luster-specific smarts inside of the Romeo Luster driver. It just did the most simple common denom common um, interface to, to Luster. But recently, there have been um, extensions added so that uh, the Romeo driver will request a larger stripe size even if the default stripe size is quite small. Uh, and so these, these, these are things that the, the Romeo driver does uh, on behalf of the user without any intervention. Now this naturally leads to the question, what file systems does Romeo support? Well, Romeo supports the big popular parallel file systems right now, GPFS, Luster, PANF, PANFS, PVFS. It's, as we mentioned earlier, supports some, some non-file system file systems like Grid FTP, although that's getting a little bit uh, long in the tooth these days. Uh, it also supports some very old file systems, which I don't even know are even uh, up and running anymore, such as the old uh, uh, HP parallel file system and um, some legacy, uh, sorry, uh, NEC has a scalable file system. Um, these, these are all options around there that have, have kind of gotten gotten old in the days. But any any parallel file system that folks will run into today, uh, Romeo will, will work with. Now let me ask a, a derivative of that. You mentioned several parallel file systems in there. And earlier we were talking about how uh, Romeo uses a POSIX read and write interface uh, to, you know, as the, as the lower layer. Do the parallel file systems offer different than POSIX semantics? Like when they, when you know a parallel write is coming, do they have a specific a API for that rather than just plain vanilla POSIX read and write? Well, a lot of file systems don't. Um, it's, it's not, you know, for example, uh, the, the more uh, researchy oriented, uh, parallel, file, parallel oriented, parallel PBFS project that was done between Argon and Clemson, uh, did develop a set of of, of not POSIX uh, semantics and, and API calls, which were developed and, and, and implemented with MPIO access in mind. They were not at all tailored towards clients ever using them directly, but meant instead to map almost directly to the MPIO, the Romeo MPIO calls. And so, um, in those cases, you can do things like um, it's not so much the scheduling of operations that's done. It's more uh, being able to use some very rich descriptions of the I.O. patterns. So Rajiv mentioned multidimensional arrays, which is quite common in scientific applications. And the, um, the, the POSIX interface for non for non-contiguous and strided uh, I.O. Is, is okay, but it's, it's kind of primitive in, in many respects. And sometimes file systems like PDFS have a much more robust way of describing these data types, uh, allowing for much more concise representation and better performance in some cases. So back on the supported file systems, what if Romeo doesn't have an explicit driver? Can Am I completely out of luck using MPIIO? Uh, no. Uh, there's a, there's a catch-all generic uh, using POSIX with no optimizations or no assumptions about anything special uh, driver, which uh, in, in many cases is the first and sometimes the only driver used by some of these file systems. When we say supported file systems, we mean that someone's gone in and, and made additional efforts to exploit any of the optimizations like direct I.O. or um, 
any particularly sophisticated interfaces or, or um, uh, tuning that, that those file systems might support. But there is a catch-all POSIX-like interface. And so if you can do uh, open, close, and read and write to a file system, there's a, a basic driver that will work for that. Now, we mentioned earlier in the, in the show here that Romeo is used with lots of MPI libraries. It's actually it's used with OpenMPI as well. And before OpenMPI, I used it in LAM MPI as well. How, how did this happen? How did you guys tend to take over the world like this? Well, Romeo was implemented using the MPI2 external interfaces, uh, the, the features in the external interface chapter, uh, such as the MPI type get and contents and type get envelopes that that allows you to to understand what is an MPI derived data type or sort of to <clears throat> to parse the derived data type in a portable way. So that allows you to hook up uh, with any MPI implementation and also the generalized requests. So for the non-blocking I/O, we use the generalized requests so that we can use the test and wait uh, functions. Uh, so these were added in MPI 2, and, and Romeo was also being written at that time. So I, I took advantage of that and, and wrote it in a way that it can work with any MPI implementation. And there was no other MPI I/O implementation, and and people didn't want to re-implement everything, so they just they just took Romeo and, and added it. And yeah, cases, there, were, there were many MPI implementations, you know, the SGI and HP and whatnot, and so they all just uh, added. Romeo. You know, we were all lazy is really what it came down to. And, and you yeah. guys did a great job. So why not? Uh, why reinvent the wheel? Um, a derivative question, though. So this is obviously MPI specific technology, but is there a, a core engine inside or something like that inside Romeo that is useful in a different uh, potentially non MPI context? Yeah, the basic collective IO optimizations and the data saving and so forth, they, they can be used outside of an MPI context. And then they have been used in the IO community outside of MPI. But right now, the, the code uses MPI for communication and so forth. So if you didn't have MPI, it would be hard to, or you'd have to use something else for communication to, to get that piece. Is there anything you no, I, add wrong? And from a software engineering standpoint, there's no uh, live magic you could pull out of uh, Romeo and use somewhere else. There's pretty uh, pretty tight assumption that MPI will be around. But as Rajiv says, the idea is uh, have been around for a while, the ideas of two-phase I.O. And, and, and some of these data type operations. So uh, certainly places can take those ideas and, and use, uh, reapply the, re-implement them in, in different contexts without, and use, use the ideas that have been, have been proven helpful in Romeo and, and use them in a different context. Yeah. <clears throat> So say I'm a file system vendor or some sort of database vendor or some sort of you know large data warehouse vendor, anything like that, and I wanted to make a Romeo interface to my data, who should I contact about that? Well, that would be me, Rob Latham, uh, Rob L at ncs.anl.gov, and I will work with you to make sure that uh, Romeo. Uh, we've, been, we've got a pretty good history of working with... Uh, Vendors uh, in, uh, for file systems and, and, and other cases. Uh, we just spent uh, a year ago. We, were, you know, we incorporated a whole bunch of, of Cray, Cray and uh, Sun to generated patches for uh, for Luster to make it better perform well. Um, before that, we, we took a bunch of patches from Panassas that, that took advantage of some of uh, some some Panassas uh, tuning optimizations. So uh, yeah, we, we, uh, that's how it goes. Uh, it's a, it's a, as, I don't know if we should talk about it as much, but Romeo is a fairly mature project at this point. We don't have, you know, the, the standard hasn't been changed in, in 15 years. The MPI 3 stuff is coming along, but, uh, you know, the code is fairly uh, stable at this point. So adding a new driver uh, is the only, the only kind of changes that happen in Romeo these days is maybe an extra file system changes. Well, so that's a perfect lead-in for my next question. What's coming up in I.O. and MPI 3? Is there anything new being discussed? You seem to imply... That there is. <laughs> so the main thing in MPI three is probably going to be the non-blocking collective I/O functions, which follow naturally from the non-blocking collective communication functions. And there have been discussions of some other features, but I I don't think they're going to make it. Uh, the main, so the main thing is so as such, it's mostly stable the the interface, uh, and most probably the non-blocking file I/O 
So instead of the split uh, collective I.O. functions, which were kind of a, it was not a real non-blocking collective I.O. function, there will be the a, a truly non-blocking collective uh, file read-write type of functions. Yes, and the, the HDF guys are uh, proposing some other things as well that we're, we're giving them a very hard time about. We'll... We'll see if that makes it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. like you said, Rajiv, I don't, I don't have strong faith in those given the short deadline for MPI-3 yeah. as well either. Yeah. All right, so let me ask the flip side of that. What's, uh, what's coming in Romeo? You said it's mature and whatnot. Do you guys anticipate on uh, implementing all the new whatever comes in MPI-3 or you know, what, what is the rate of change these days? Is it pretty slow? It's fairly slow, but of course uh – We'll work with the HDF5 guys to, uh, and, you know, the proposed changes, uh, uh, not the non-blocking collectives, the, uh, the, any of the proposed shared file changes. We can work with the group, the community, to uh, incorporate this stuff. Uh, the other big changes are some uh, algorithmic changes, uh, possibly as machines get even larger uh, on the scale of, say, blue gene, about 160,000 MPI processes. We're, st- we're starting to find algorithms inside Romeo that, are not as memory efficient as they could be. They allocate some data structures that scale with a number of processors. Um, we can use things like these MPI-3 neighbor collectives to maybe come up with some more scalable uh, algorithms. Um, but we need to pay a little more attention to how we, how we perform at the very largest scale. It's, it's kind of amazing that Romeo has progressed for uh, 15 years without some um, without, these, without any more significant uh, changes to the algorithm that it has have had, but it's been a good run and it needs a little more uh, attention at the larger scales right now. So I'm a user. I want to start implementing MPIO. Should I look to Romeo's documentation or should I talk to um, my MPI vendor? The, the basic, well, maybe I should let Rajiv answer it because he wrote the book, but. Uh, you should look at the MPI spec or the MPI tutorial, you know, the MPI uh, tutorial material on how to use MPI I/O functions, and that's all. You, you you don't need to worry about. And as long as you have an MPI implementation, which is MPI two compliant, uh, it'll just work for you. Uh, I think the best resource is the using using MPI two book. It's the we just call it the purple MPI book around here. Um, and, and Rajiv is one of the co-authors of that, of that book, and it's been a great resource for uh, all the MPI, MPI I.O. features from very simple to the very complex, and, and it lays it out pretty, in a pretty straightforward way, and it's a great place to get started on um, how do you for change speaks. However, maybe the other point to make is uh, these days MPI I.O. is more often a foundation layer. Uh, most people use MPI I.O. through another library like uh, HDF5 or Parallelnet CDF or Audios or something else. So... Uh, maybe depending on um, your your needs, you may not even need to use MPIO directly at all. But there may be some better way to go about it. Okay, guys. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, what's the website and contact information for Romeo? Romeo is hosted at www.mcs.anl.gov/romeo. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and we will have this up soon. Thanks again for your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us.